was trying to get my tweet out just saying that Alan was too kind. Uh, but uh, thank you, Piers. Thank you, Amanda, Andrew, everybody, just uh, for inviting me here. This is great. I'm trying to get my time around to make sure I don't eat up too much of it. Um, so this, I've entitled this uh, talk, I made a little revision after talking to Pierce. It's now called Say Goodbye to Bizarro World. You'll see why, I hope. Um, basically, you know, children love playing the, the opposite game, where yes means no and no means yes. You know, our politicians seem to enjoy that game too a bit. Um, but this backwards world ha ha has penetrated through many different cultural spheres and taken hold as a everyday concept infecting our every action. In comics, it's known as Bizarro World, where our strengths, it's a common plot device where often our strengths become our weaknesses. And of course, that's a fictional conceit, but in the world of cinema, we all now too truly inhabit a land of opposites where what we say we love what we say we love to do is not what we do at all. And that must change, and that's what I want to talk to you about. Quick segue, though. Unfortunately, I, I made a mistake and got the, uh, my handouts passed beforehand. So if I see you reading, I'm going to point to you. You have, can't read them until I'm done. <laughs> um, but back to the talk. Uh, I, I wish that uh, this was some sort of evil conspiracy that led us to create a Frankenstein monster out of our best intentions. But it's more likely just our own laziness and, and greed that enable us to transform what is an incredible art form into a global economic enterprise that generally is reduced to promoting the lowest common denominators and our most base desires. We accept, promote, participate in what is simply doable instead of striving for what is now entirely possible. Now, more than ever before, we have the opportunity to reach something much higher. And the first step is to try to get out of our rut of antiquated behavior. We have inherited and rely on a complete ecosystem of entertainment spanning through development, production, marketing, and distribution that is no longer applicable to the world that we inhabit. And it gets a little worse than that even. You know, th this archaic ecosystem of ours corrupts both us and our creations until each become the very antithesis of what I think inspired most everyone in this room to create in the first place. Our current ecosystem certainly represented by Hollywood, but I would say by the global market, does not want art. It does not want an ambition. It does not want innovation. It wants to limit risk, and it defines that by imitating what has already been done. If it works, make a sequel. Like that actor in a type of role, cast her again in the exact same way next time. Tell the same story every three years for another generation to claim as its own. Now, I don't blame anyone for this corruption. At least, I'm not blaming them yet. Uh, it's up to us to accept this as a challenge. And the question, which I hope we can answer today even, is will we? We've been, we've been standing in the, the dinosaur's footprint, standing in the center of it all for far too long to actually recognize where we've come from. And if we, if we don't start to move in a direction, we're going to kind of continue on that dinosaur's path. You know where it goes. Now, the, the film business was constructed on the idea of scarcity of content, on the idea of, a, of complete control of that content through centralized distribution, and on the belief that we could actually have people focus their attention towards that content. For over 100 years, we have made our, it our business to rely on a single product that we simply repurpose for different platforms. The production, the distribution, has been diversified, 
intricate, expensive, specialized processes that require the involvement of many. That's how it's been done for 100 plus years. And that does not reflect the world we live in today in any way. We now live in an era of grand abundance of content, where close to 50,000 feature films are generated per year on a global basis. America remains the number one consumption market in the world, and is said to be able to consume about 500 titles annually. So that's 1% of the global annual supply. It's going to take America an entire century to get through the movies that are made in 2013. <laughs> Simultaneously, it is no longer a time where there's any control of that content. We can watch anything, anywhere, anytime, on any device. And we can't focus people at all towards that content. This is an era of total distraction. Everyone is overwhelmed, crushed by this infinite choice, the tyranny of choice, such that it is he whoever yells the loudest takes all. And it's ironic that in this time of abundance and access, we actually discover less. We suffer for it. We get stuck in these ruts and echo chambers of like-minded mental masturbation, reinforcing our opinions and strengthening our differences. That's bizarro world. It's not the world I think we intended. Tell me something else that is, as is immersive, possibly mind-blowing, that creates a shared emotional response into a large room of strangers, compels them to talk about it for hours and end, and sometimes even to fall madly in love. Now, I know a few of those things, but they're still illegal. So, you know, <laughs> film is the one that could do it. The whole world over, we see, we see film culture in the same crisis, right? Creators cannot sustain themselves financially, no matter how good their work is. The fair market value for our work has decreased substantially over the last decades to a fraction of once it, what it once was. When I started making movies 25 years ago, if I made a film that multiple buyers wanted, the fair market value that I could expect in the, for my North American rights was 50% of my, my negative cost. 15 years ago, it was 30%. 10 years ago, it was 25%. That was OK, because the, the international value was going up to 100%. But now, I actually would say it's 10%. And to quote a, a foreign sales agent uh, who asked me two years ago, can you tell me what the international sales business is when Greece, Portugal, Spain, Italy, rarely France, rarely Japan, even buy our movies anymore, when we've lost 50% of the international value? The fact is, good movies don't get seen. Consumers demand that content be free, but they seem happy to shell out thousands of dollars to pay for the hardware to watch that content on it. Meanwhile, the hardware manufacturers and the rights aggregators get rich while the creators get pennies. Participants in these passion industries of ours are frequently just exploited for their commitment and dedication. We watch the, the hope of the long tail get crushed by the tsunami of new, where, where um, again, that, that entire system only benefits those that yell the loudest. Our film culture has bifurcated it into these two sides, one of tent poles of men in long underwear and capes with redundant family fables that sing the song of great self-esteem. And on the other hand, the hordes of passionate amateurs now forced to make movies for mere pit pittance. We have created a corporate culture committed primarily to risk mitigation, and thus ultimately resulting in the obliteration of ambitious, original, and humanist cinema. And all of this from the dreams of well-intentioned artists who wanted to make the world a better place with beauty and laughter and understanding. We've created bizarro world. Now, this is not a sad story. It's not a time to despair. I think it truly is the opposite, a time for rejoicing. Because on the other side of that coin, 
we see that never before have creators had the opportunity to not just make what they want, but also to be the direct financial beneficiaries of that work. That storytelling now can be unleashed across multiple platforms, creating new forms of both discovery and engagement, unaffected by release schedules or distribution patterns. Never before have filmmakers been free to step away from the mass market dictates of, uh, of corporate storytelling and to address the desire of, of the niches. A local fo focus can now have both national impact and global reach by utilizing the tools that are available for everyone essentially for free. Market, fo market focus no longer needs to be directed to the lowest common denominator. We can actually encourage aspirational behavior. The tools and the costs of creation, production, distribution, marketing are all now more affordable, accessible, and easier to use than ever before. Deep engagement with fans can build sustainable communities of real, communi uh, of real collaboration. This, those things are incredible. It's an incredible time. It could be a revolutionary time. Creators and artists could focus on the stories they dream of in whatever form they find best and live sustainable careers dictated by no one but themselves. The question of how we do all of this need not be a mystery. There are proofs of principles already. Best practices are now being established. This step off the plantation and into a utopian era, era requires one thing, responsibility. And that creators and their benefactors must accept the responsibility both for their work and the comprehensive externalities of that work throughout the entire ecosystem. Now, is that so hard? Isn't that what we're supposed to do with our children? You know, at least until they mature, or else we should actually abstain from having them? I think it's kind of the same thing now w with the work that we create in cinema. Yet, our industry and the education system around it has been encouraging the equivalent of unprotected sex without requiring filmmakers to be responsible for their creative offspring or creative consequences. We are tra trained to budget our babies and sell them at market for less than their value, not to guide them down the line so they can actually generate wealth for us into our ripe old age. Filmmakers have to now learn how to budget, schedule, and project their revenues for their work across a movie's entire um, lifespan, not just until you bring it to festival. We have to learn how to do that through the entire release and lifespan of the film. Now, I recognize that when I, when I ask for this, it's hard for some. For those that, that, that have got to drink the milk and the honey, it's kind of equivalent to saying, you know, stop being a prince and learn how to be a working man. Or for those that are inside the kingdom, it's this, it is as, as if you have to learn how to fish rather than just be handed a, handed a fish. But if our culture and our society are to provide the king the keys to a land of ambition, diversity, unbridled creativity, that is what has to be done. And I wouldn't ask all of, us, all of you in the room to do it if I hadn't already taken the step forward to do it myself. I used to despair that there were few doing what to me seems absolutely necessary and commonsensical. But of course, if, if information changed behavior, people wouldn't smoke, be obese, have unprotected sex, or any other uh, behavior that uh, kind of leads to some unintended results. When a friend of mine pointed out to me that the, that gulf between what is necessary and what people are willing to do already has a name, and they call it business, I decided to change my attitude. There are 
many little fixes, hacks, significant important improvements, but they are often are not the stuff of high margin scalable enterprises. And that creates another challenge for all of us. These simple fixes may not be the, re the, the work of big business. They won't attend to them. But I do believe that they are certainly the place for entities that could benefit from building sustainable cultural enterprises for diverse communities. I think they have a name for those too. I think they often call them nation states or governments. They don't call them the American government where we remain one of two industrialized nations that don't support the cinema, cinematic arts. So last year, after close to producing close to 70 films, Alan, not 60, 70, and I would say mostly, you know, fil films that I would say were of ambition and risk and humanist concern, I chose to take a hiatus from producing to try to help build a better infrastructure for the film industry. A modest pursuit. <laughs> and in the States, I saw my only option to do that was in the nonprofit world. And I can't say for sure that I would do it the same today, but if I lived in a land where there was government support for the cinematic arts, I know I would want to help lead a transition in this way, in this era. For those of us that have had the privilege of creating for so long, I think we also have the responsibility to facilitate so that future generations, future artists, can also have even better opportunities. I think the EU has a chance to truly lead the world into this era of media and creative democracy. And that makes me wish that my passport could change colors. But there is a lot of work to do, and I wish I had the time and the permission to do it with all of you, but I'm happy to drill down into these details at a later date with anyone that wants to reach out. But with, uh, as I was asked to tr keep this uh, to about 15 or 20 minutes, and how am I doing? It's right on schedule. I want to try to hit a few kind of key points which I think uh, Film, government, film bodies, su national support agencies should address. There's five key things right now I see. One is to provide creators with the entrepreneurial training to maximize their work's lifespan. To do, as I mentioned, to budget, schedule, and project revenues to the entire course of a, of a film's life. Two, I hold a great hope in institutionalizing stage financing. That's financing for films that is not all up front, but in known key areas, whether often we just see development and production. But there are stages of production and certainly stages of release that could entirely change the way movies are made if we knew there were places to go. You see this in many other industries where stage financing becomes a much better projection in terms of success and allows both uh, creators to shift when cultural changes occur. Three, to help and encourage the creators to stop the long-term all media territorial licensing of the rights to their films and instead start to focus on being the owner operators owners of the IP of their work. And again, the filmmakers in the EU are way ahead of uh, folks in the States in this regard. And really, for work to facil help creators facilitate building and engaging with their audiences into such a manner that they become collaborators and particip participatory <laughs> individuals transforming audience, fans into audience, and audience into community. And then five, the shift from a, a business based on a single product focus to one of a relationship basis with that community. Those are the five key things I think we need to focus uh, over the next few years. We have watched 
our era already changed, but we've done very little to change either our business structure or our art form. We have to accept that that cultural change has occurred, and we have to stop trying to force our work um, to maintain the same as we once did, or to believe that the infrastructure that exists is the correct form. We have to stop holding on to what is no longer actually there. There is this great opportunity for greater diversity. Do we truly want to limit that just so that we can hang on to what we've enjoyed for so long for a few more years? When we recognize that this world we're living in is quite different from that infrastructure that we created, that we're living in this bizarro world, we have to ask ourselves, what is our what was our original hope for film? It was an art form that both captured and informed our time, inspiring all of us to aspire to a better world than the one we currently have. Now is the first time that I think we can truly achieve that hope for film. All right. There. And um, a few questions. And, uh, Excellent. No hurry. You're, you're doing great. We're doing good. Thank you. Very stimulating. And, and I should light, I should mention um, I had uh, thanks I had prepared some handouts from a workshop that I did around these ideas that I believe have been distributed to you. They kind of broken down into three groups of what I think that the film business needs to look at, what has happened in the world that should change, I believe, how we create and earn a living from what we do, and my recommendations for best practices for filmmakers. So that's everything I know. You don't have to answer any it. questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I'd like to start just by echoing um, Sir Alan and Piers and just saying it's just so brilliant um, to have Ted here, we absolutely need innovative leaders like you. And I think, having heard what Ted said, I, you know, there's part of me that thinks on the one hand, it's kind of daunting. What's out there is daunting. Being able to shift to a place where we can predict future revenue for an entire life cycle of a film, for example. Um, on the other hand, I really hear your call to action. Um, and I think one of the brilliant things about all of us being here and about FERA is that, you know, we have communication channels that are already open and it feels like there is an imperative now to be able to use those channels to be able to share distribution strategies and tactics and success stories um, and probably most importantly failures uh, as well. So. Um, I just wanted to begin with a bit of uh, local stuff, I guess, that I, I'm finding particularly true to the UK, which is that documentary filmmakers seem to uh, be doing quite exciting things in terms of how they are reaching out to find new audiences. Um, Lizzie, obviously, is here and did the most magnificent kind of job on the age of being stupid. But documentary filmmakers seem to be finding alliances with NGOs or brands in some instances. And I guess my opening question is, is there an inherent difference between documentary film cinema being able to kind of achieve more easily access to those audiences, or is narrative, are we just behind? There's definitely an advantage. Um, I also see often or look at how the business structures also corrupt what we create. And you see this in the States, I think, because of uh, this ability to take a theme that a documentary film might have and be able to immediately find that audience. In the States, I would argue that 90% of the films now, of the doc films, are thesis-oriented movies right. that, that, you know, frequently around kind of social justice, social message issues that 
feel like the whole reason of being from a business structure, you know, which isn't the only reason, but from a business structure is the fact that it has an easy to identify audience. And it's much harder now to find the kind of expressionistic doc um, or the doc that is still asking a, a question that it may not know the answer to before it begins. Um, and it's interesting to me because I've often described my own film work as being biased towards the experiment as opposed to the, the proof, a film that wants to learn as it is made as opposed to just demonstrate what it already knows. But in terms of that kind of ability of narrative to identify its audience at, ahead of time, I think that it's, it's part of that uh, difficulty of taking an ecosystem that was designed for everybody and try to realize what is a different model when you no longer have to do that. Um, and I think a lot of it is the, the again, the, the necessary shift to a community focus, you know, from a, from a product focus. Mm -hmm. That narrative will, you'll find a whole host of common themes that people share, often value statements of one form or of another. I reference, you know, the, the, the dominance in the family film of these tales of, of learning self-esteem, right? Every single family film seems to be like, you know, I can win the race. <laughs> you know, I thought I was a wimp, but I'm actually <laughs> not. Um, and uh, yet you could easily group those together into some form of community collective that is about self-esteem. So you're saying fi find an audience through people's values? Yes, I think, I think that if we took a fraction of the time that, that, that we spent in marketing our individual work and instead tried to build communities around these like-minded themes so that instead of having to say, you know, I make my movie and I have to ask all these people to come to it, wouldn't it be a lot easier if there were already people who were gathered who had already declared themselves around some sort of commonality that I could simply use my film as the reason that this group of friends could come together? Does that, I mean, it's, it, it's, it, it still feels like that on one level it's, it's the, the imagined audience to a certain extent. And I kind of feel like as, as directors, is there data? Where is the data to show what's working and what's not? Particularly in art expression focus art, cinema, is there data that can show us where people are successfully reaching out, where people aren't? How can we get access to it? Yeah, it, it's, it's, so, it's so hard. And again, why if there was a shift to more um, owner-operator idea in terms of filmmakers who might actually be self-releasing or building a team to help in the release, that data could, could spread more widely. You know, that uh, I even as a person, so for instance, on uh, the f last one I did with Todd Solons, I distributed it myself in the States with 17 people, you know, that I hired or commissioned to work with me, um, but found that even in like VOD land where there's so much help, hope, uh, you are bound by so many agreements of confidentiality that you don't often even get the number of transactions you do on their platforms. It is still so cloaked, you know, which why for Do you think it'll stay like, I mean, how, well, no, how do you like get transparency? Well, that's in, that's in the cable world, which is the, the dom dominant form. But if you look on online, if you choose to work with Vimeo or a white label player like VHX.TV, you know, that you will have full access to and you can buy it. And there's, you know, a good movement going on with filmmakers in the independent space who are sharing case studies. But it's amazing to me how few and far between. I've been building a, a master list of that and I think I have all of 12, right, that are readily available, you know, um, online. It's, it's disappointing, you know. Um, but I'm happy to talk numbers. I, we spent 172000 on Dark Horse in the States to bring it out to, I think, 56 different markets. And what percentage of the overall budget was that? Um, of the overall budget, that's 5%. Okay. Approximately. Uh, six. And 
Is is that something that you would say to... Interesting that you hired a team of 15 as well, because I think often we hear as directors that, you know, it's not about finishing a film and putting it into a festival. It's now, what are you going to do? How are you going to take responsible, responsibility for its life afterwards? How can we take responsibility for finding um, audiences in order to get uh, a better re remuneration? Remuneration. Um, 5% is what you spent on, 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 the on of the total cost. So is that something that you would argue we should all be thinking to put into a production budget now, which is our own social media distribution? Like, that should be well, across the board. That yes, should be going into Yes, it. but I think everyone here is an artist, and uh, thus probably is going to be betray themselves quite quite well, as I know that every time that I did did put that money in the budget, I couldn't resist raiding that cooking jar, cookie jar in the process, which is why I, I think there needs to be institutionalized financing that allows people to, to step forward and something on a not-for-profit basis I'm trying to do it in the states, um, but there's far more hope of doing that you know, in the EU, frankly. Um, we just want one piece of this, too, that, again, we get caught up on the numbers of our individual films and saying, looking at them on a case-by-case -case basis. And that prevents us from going out and building an audience around our film that we can go back to each and every time. And, you know, I, I have a blog called Hope for Film, Dot com, um, and this week uh, a, a local UK filmmaker um, posted a, a po did a blog post on why would I give away my Academy nominated short film for free, and he spoke about building his audience. And while that post hit, I was consulting with some local filmmakers in the Bay Area who had made a short film and uh, were in the process of making a feature. And they chose to, to follow a very similar approach where they're uh, releasing the short and in, over, uh, in order to create a mailing list and a database for their feature. And in the course of three days, they, like the filmmaker who, who wrote the blog post for me, built an audience of 100,000 people very quickly. Now, that's on a global basis. But the fact that, that that can be done and we can look at how we create not just a feature film, but a story world that might have many extensions, non-monetized content that can be used for, for longer range planning, a short film in the same thematic or, or story world, same characters that can be given away for free in exchange for an email address and build that around, uh, yeah. build that over the long term is something that isn't being done yet and you think would be done you know, by everybody. Similarly, you know, you look at the music industry and they long ago recognized that the music, their business wasn't the recorded item and it wasn't the live event. It was the merchandise that they sold at those events. We have these things called film festivals and tell me which film festival has a merch hall where all the filmmakers can sell totemic objects fetish objects from their films, have a live crowdfunding event where you can buy dinner with, with me for $500, you know, Cheap. whatever, you know, $1,500, I'm sorry. I mean, um, but you were going to pay for the sushi, that's why I put it at that price. Thank you. Hello, Elizabeth Shostad, CEO of Ferra. Um, thank you very much, Ted, for a very inspiring talk. I wanted to pick up on your point on, on uh, keep be, be remaining the owners of our own IP. And I'm wondering who precisely you're talking about, because you, since we're um, a federation of directors, you know, sometimes the first, the first opponent, if you will, is the producers who, who demand the handover, but often the, the broadcasters on the other side of the producers ha asking for their, them to hand over the rights, and, and it becomes an endless chain of people wanting to, to amass all the rights that were there in the first place. So how do we start breaking this chain? where the mantra we're hearing all the time, and especially now more than ever, really, uh, is that uh, 
even an individual producer won't get the time of day from iTunes or Google because they want everything to be aggregated in aggregated deals. So they're really setting us up for not controlling our own IP, and how do we break that chain? Well, every revolution starts with the same simple word, right? Which is no. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it is a process and it's really hard, you know. Um, I would say that the kind, the plan of what I wanted to do for a kind of new era was something I mapped out about eight years ago, and I couldn't do because I had a seat of privilege. I was getting still paid well for my movies. They were still getting sold in the marketplace. And I watched the percentage keep dropping. And uh, I kept thinking that, well, OK, if I make something for a lower price point, I could retain it and try to prove this principle. And yet, many times, my collaborators instead would say, no, we want to take that money up front and be done with it. And yet, yet you see the results never were as we dreamed or, or hoped they would be. It's really difficult, <laughs> is, the, is the reality. On the director to producer level, that to me is a lot easier to solve. You know, um, I think you can very quickly tell um, folks who share kind of a common interest. I, I frequently advise folks and people say, well, I'm trying to find my producer. How do, how do I do that? And I say, well, you can easily tell by looking at their credits whether they're a deal-driven producer or someone who's driven by the work. And you just have to ask yourself which of those that you want. I, one of the reasons I chose to take a hiatus uh, from producing was the the belief that in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, from everything I had read, I felt I would be in a uh, community of shared mindset where uh, in the startup world, um, which I find very inspiring as a, as a model, um, people will you know fight to the bone doing everything to maintain the fact that they are the owner. Uh, uh, of the IP. And again, this model of institutionalized stage financing and why I think it's something that governmental bodies should actually try to step in to help is it supports that model. It allows you to figure out methods you know, where you can retain the ultimate authority. And certainly, you know, as Piers mentioned, the, the, the owner of the copyright has has far better chance of doing it than, frankly, the system in the states. But when it then comes to licensing, it's a it's a process, right? That uh, when I did Dark Horse, Todd Solon's movie, this was a film that played competition in Venice, right? We didn't get the best reviews coming out of Venice, but we had the the style of reviews that we knew that we would be able to turn to what we needed by the time of our release, and we did. Um, that when we took it to Toronto, we really our first kind of sales place, we had packed screenings. I got 13 offers out of Toronto. But they were frequently for about a third of what I felt was the fair market value for those films. And so my proposition to those entities was fine. I'll license it for that. And you do a third of your normal term instead of for 15 years. You know, let's do it for five, which seemed very fair to me. You know, digital is not a mature market at all. We actually don't know what the value is. And we've been allowing those platforms to earn their revenue on an aggregation model that we as creators don't actually get to participate in for the most part. Um, I think that, that that can be done. And I really do believe, particularly in smaller territorial markets, the ability to, to create a, a um, community of proselytizers, of folks who sh see the shared benefit in, in um, supporting the, the artist, allows that to get amplified across a multiple territorial basis. Um, in the States, again, I, I look at the, uh, the model of the music industry quite, quite a bit. And most of the labels now encourage their artists to have a artist-owned site. And generally, the practice, as I understand it, is the label 
still does all of the backroom delivery, everything to maintain it, and yet gives the artists 100% of the revenues, frequently on the condition that they sell like at a 10% higher price point. And the, the general belief is that, uh, and I don't know if this number is still accurate, for a while that was 12% uh, of the revenue was coming from direct artist sales. But the, the general belief was that the marketing costs went way down, mm -hmm. as did unauthorized copying, too. Because, you know, you don't walk out on a bill, even though evidently most people would walk out on a restaurant bill if they didn't actually look at the waiter or waitress and see them eye to eye. If they didn't have that personal contact, people would tend to try to skip out on paying their due. And I think it's the same sort of thing. How do we facilitate a much deeper relationship with our communities so that they are vested in the same process? It's, it's interesting what you say about the artist thing too because the stats coming out now too where the product, i.e. the film name or the album name doesn't get as much attention as the actual artists behind it, right? Yes. Hope, hope for film. <laughs> Keep it personal. Okay, um, my name's Beryl Richards, I'm Vice Chair of Directors UK. Um, I'd like to ask you about like-minded minded communities. Um, one thing I've noticed recently is um, I've had, I have quite a lot of shorts going to festivals, particularly in the States, um, and given the into like you know independent festivals, and that seems to be a place that um, is a like-minded community where you have a whole bunch of people in that locality who are interested in you know different cinema, um, and I've noticed that a few of those festivals have been contacting me to open up um, a download uh, facility for, these are for shorts, um, so that their, you know, their network can download and you, you apparently will get some money back. I don't know how well it works as a model. But I just wondered how that sort of, whether you felt that sort of thing might grow and how that would fit into your sort of world view mm -hmm. of it. I, I, I personally don't think that that's the, the, the best value of a festival or the best value of a, of a film um, myself. That I think that one of the great things that uh, festivals do is they curate both the content and the audience. And for what they can do for filmmakers is deliver direct relationships to that audience. They have the lock on the local Right? So if you're going to do something online, I think the fair exchange is the, the direct, that direct relationship. It doesn't need to be owned by the festival. It should be owned by the, the artist. And um, I think one of the things that, that you know, happens with, with uh, short films, like I, I've, this so, I've been uh, accepting my, any invite to be a judge of short film content these days because it is so vibrant. There's so much good work that, that's out there. And it fits the internet so well, right? It's very hard to, to invest your, your time in a feature length film and think that you'll get the proper return of the investment of your engagement. Right? People are very skeptical of that. I, I think I shared with, with Alan last night a line my 13-year-old my son is that he doesn't like movies, but he's loved every one he's seen. Right? So the idea of spending 90 minutes in a theater is not something that he finds compelling, right? but he's loved the experience. Whereas the thought that you're going to stop what you're doing for five, six, seven, eight minutes and watch a short is much more, you know, you can do that in the office. Right. Yet, um, you know, frequently what we have failed to do, and when I speak about like, you know, we've had 125 years of cinema, and yet we've un have yet to unlock the organizing potential of film. I often use as a model this short doc called Kane's Arcade. Has anyone seen this short, Kane's Arcade? Well, 12 and a half million people in the world have, and only two in this room. But it's a, it's a really kind of fascinating story. The documentary filmmaker's door handle fell off his car. So he pulled up to an auto parts store in the summer, I think East LA, and went into this auto parts store. And in there was a 12-year-old boy, 10-year-old boy, the, the owner's son, 
who the owner couldn't send his kid to camp. He didn't make enough money. So the kid had spent the entire summer making a cardboard game arcade. A g traditional g games, but all made out of cardboard. The filmmaker looked at it, looked at this big-eyed, smiling young man, and said, wow, what a great short doc this would make. He made a little doc, and on the last day of filming, he took the boy out to lunch. But he didn't tell the boy that he uh, posted a, a flash mob request um, to come play at the arcade um, scheduled to occur when, the, when he dropped the boy off afterwards. And when they pulled up the car, there were about 200 people lined up. And this kid had a glowing face to begin with, but now this was like a radiant sun. He couldn't believe that everyone, that he you know, built it and they came. Um, nice little short, right? But what the filmmaker did was before he put it online, was he built the site and embedded a call to action, which was, let's raise a scholarship fund of $50,000 for Kane so this innovative kid can really have his due. When people first started engaging with the film, it wasn't go watch this great movie of this smiling, innovative kid. It was, I just saw this film and I gave a dollar to his education fund. So they thought they would raise $50,000. By the second week, they were up to 150 grand. But 350 after that, at that point, the filmmaker said, holy cow, I gotta do something. He started a, a, a foundation to use cardboard in the schools as a tool for innovation. They raised $400,000 for, for that fund and over a million dollars for Kane's education, right? They embedded the call to action within the experience of the film, right? They used an entrepreneurial activity for ultimately to change a boy's life and a boy's opportunity. You know, like th there's so much more that we can do when we look at really, you know, more than just entertaining or believing that our art can stand on its own and really have the, the potential, unlock the potential that it has. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll pass this, but what I find quite interesting there is that, that short films you think might well be the, partly the key into all this. Well, I, I also think, you know, to me, on the feature world, it's a movement towards, you know, a story world where, you know, I really think now as you make a feature, you really want to try to figure out five other elements uh, of uh, extensions from, from your narrative. You know, uh, from my wife's documentary that we're doing um, on kind of the, the history of U.S.-China diplomacy, a small, unambitious subject. It's one, uh, one feature, one one-hour movie, 20 online shorts, and two festival shorts is the full piece. I, I was speaking to Annette last night, who's doing a very, very similar thing, which is a film based on a, a novel that includes uh, 20, is it, webisodes? 125 webisodes, Ooh. then a six-part TV series, and then also a feature film. So, I mean, that's that's about finding different formats, right? I mean, that's that's is that speaking to different audiences? The use well, of different. You know, it, it's curious. Like when I when I did Adventureland, um, I was able. I tried many times before, but finally, I was successful in getting. Um, the studio to give us fifty thousand dollars to have a video crew all the time to create content, not to do behind the scenes, you know, not to do your, your EPK, but to try to create additional content. And we made twelve short films using the actors. See, it was a special mm. occasion. You know, we had young actors, most who weren't stars yet. Kristen Stewart had yet to do Twilight. Jesse. Eisenberg had yet to do social network. Um, the the uh, but we had them booked for run of the show, and we had a location that we owned for the run of the show. So we we brought in these young directors that our director approved, and we did kind of like training videos for the theme park, featuring the extra mm -hmm. people. You know, doing documentaries on the unique the characters' unique traits. But what occurred was it was obviously a different uh, style map 
than uh, what the feature was. Uh, and the studio felt that it, w it was a, a mixed message. And so they, they said that unless we got, um, I think it was MySpace then, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the cover of my, my, they, 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 they didn't want uh, to go forward with it. It end, ends up on the, um, the DVD, but so it, it, wa so it, it wasn't, wasn't utilized. Out. But at the same time, I was involved with a film called Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene, mm -hmm. which was uh, made by uh, a collective, uh, one director, but he has, they kind of alternate directing the movies together, three guys, all under the age of 30, and I pitched them on this idea of here again you had, it was a story of a cult, we had a prime lo uh, single dominant location, many young actors, let's try to create some shorts around it since you're all directors. Well they did one, cost us all of $400 to do it, but that short called Mary Last Scene, which featured uh, one of the same actors, um, got into Sundance, Toronto, mm -hmm. Can New York Film Festival. Our feature got into Sundance, Can Toronto, New York. That year, uh, rather, in the last 10 years, there was only one other film that played all of those festivals. Now, I w would, w would uh, say that that short basically brought our first core audience, the festival programmers, to us for the feature. You know, and it also put all of the studio acquisition people, uh, you know, eyes and ears on our movie. So it was a film that we hadn't anticipated. You know, we thought that we would sell the U.S. for 150. That's what we asked before our Sundance screening. Instead, we sold it for 1.5 million. You know, so uh, it worked well to to set up the audience. Hi, I'm Simon Phillips from Tools of Directing. So the word story world that you've uh, introduced today is probably the most important idea that uh, actually as directors we're not looking to a film that spins off to other things. Great examples about a film and a short film. But it's, uh, can you talk about that bigger thing that you mean by story world? Sure, although I wouldn't say it's the, the biggest idea. I think it goes hand in hand with also the idea of moving your creative practice from a product orientation to a relationship orientation, because that extends beyond the story world, right? And it's also the fact that you're free to no longer have to address everybody, but you can also address targeted niches. I think both of those are really uh, major, it's kind of a major change, actually. It's, it's localized production and, and distribution as an emphasis that instead of having to reach, it doesn't mean you don't want to reach everybody, but you weren't actually free to do it before. Uh, can I check, but you're still talking about film. Uh, Absolutely. It, uh, does it, what about game or the spin-off in other media, cross media really? Well that, to me, you know, this comes back to, to story world. You know, spin-off, game, Though the, the, that's you know repurposing the content for something else, it is not part of the immersive story experience, right? So, and I think we smell that. You know, ET was one of the worst video games of all time when they created it, right? You know, Super Mario Brothers was one of the worst movies of all times when they, when they created it. Like that, that that's not an organic approach to it, and we're still experimenting on how to do cross-platform storytelling in ways that, that are true to what it, it is. But I wouldn't want to make a movie, you know, with all of the time, tears, love, labor that is going to go into a movie, I wouldn't want it without doing, to make it without doing the R&D that I now can have in my creative practice to try to experiment of different ways of engaging audiences uh, and, and satisfying them within this bigger context. Um, that unfortunately, again, that the experiments to do it haven't been so great, you know. They may never be so great, you know, if we, until we find the, the visionary that helps us understand how to, how to do it, right? But I've encountered a few of those people who I would bet on, you know, um, who I think would be the Orson Welles or George Lucas or however you want to say it other time that can make that 
that movie that changes the way that we actually do business and create. Um, Hello, I'm Dan Clifton. I'm uh, one of the Directors UK board members. So just to pick up on this point about sharing a community, let's say you make a film about you know, science and you've got a sort of sci audience of science enthusiasts and I've got a film about science and I'm interested in that community of science enthusiasts. You know, you're in San Francisco, I'm in London. How do we hook up? How does that community get built and how does it translate from project to project? Because so far I'm kind of seeing a silo of engagement that I can generate on my own and I kind of hold on to my rights and all that stuff. But actually, you know, we, we need these communities to be transferable. So how does that work? Right. No, exactly. Excellent question, Dan. Um, again, I, I think that, and why I was motivated to try to do a, a change, I think festivals and support organizations or government bodies have the real potential to, to advance uh, this, this sector. You know, the, because as curators, festivals can spot like-minded thematics and actually give them that kind of physical one-to-one in interaction that allows, you know, something new to be to be generated. Um, but again, unless there there are funds to try to put that together, you have to find incredibly motivated people who are willing to do it. It's one of the reasons why I actually think this will happen much quicker on a short form format um, than it will on the the feature form. There was a really interesting initiative that General Electric funded um, called Focus Forward. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but uh, GE put up $30,000 to 30 different uh, established documentary filmmakers to make shorts on innovation. They gave the, the filmmakers full ownership of the IP. They also built in a contest for the audience where they would be uh, crowdsourced shorts on innovation. Uh, they had, you know, hundreds of, of submissions. The most watched short on the platform is one of the shorts that came from the crowd, you know, something like, like closing in, I think, on two million views. Uh, I think eight of the filmmaker-led shorts are on the process of becoming features, right? So it's a place with that theme of innovation, fairly broad, you know, uh, but in the dark world can be accessed very easily, focus forward. Um, they also have the, 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 the right to put their films wherever they want, but it has to be branded um, by GE. But GE got a great, you know, value statement of world-class artists, you know, associating their brand with innovation. Right? So I think that that same business model of looking to, to brands that could share a, a, a broad value statement, using it on the short form format, but let, allowing the artist to retain the IP is something that we'll see um, replicated at elsewhere. Last question I think at the back, Piers is waving his watch. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, I'm got, Annette okay. K. Olesen, I'm from Denmark, uh, president of the Danish Film Directors Guild and the film director, of course. Um, I would like just to comment on the, the, the talk a, w a bit back, uh, uh, the documentary, the, the possibilities for the documentaries and the, and the fact that they seem to have moved uh, um, forward in a much faster pace than, than fiction films. And I, at least for, for in Denmark, uh, I think all of the countries, all of the European countries have some sort of subsidized state, subsidized systems. And of course that's very necessary and also um, creates a base for, for the film industries, ex uh, certainly in areas where the language is uh, very limited to a small population. Um, but uh, this system, of course, is very, very uh, helpful, but it's also restrains, it's, it, it potentially restrains uh, the, the way that we uh, distribute films. And in fiction films, in the Danish Film Institute, we are demanded to have a cinema distributor in order to have our films subsidized. That never was a demand on documentaries. So in that sense, they were freer 
to explore the possibilities of, of digital uh, distribution. And you, we see it in Denmark. It's very clear that, that all the documentarists have somehow moved uh, much faster than the rest of us. Um, but uh, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, Ted, uh, in 2010 you, you were uh, at a seminar in Denmark called Think Tank. And right after attending that seminar, you wrote in a tweet um, something that I <laughs> wondered. <laughs> it will always haunt you what you write. Something, something that I thought a lot about since. You wrote, uh, I want to be paid well for my work, but listening to subsidized producers seemed they lost incentive to listen to audience. I wondered what made you write that tweet? Uh, has that changed in your opinion regarding to European producers? Um, I can't say the exact instance what, that made me think of it, but I know that I, I spend a lot of time um, obsessing a little bit over the, the complexities of a market-driven culture, the United States, right? So we can only create for the market. It's the only way that we get funding, right? So on one hand, people uh, frequently regurgitate what has done before, what has been proven, because they can show comps. They can show comparisons of films that did well beforehand in their fundraising purpose process. On the other hand, like the great thing in uh, America is that um, we are free to exploit ourselves to our fullest advantage, right? You know, um, that, you know, basically independent film in America is a crime, right? It's based on actually violating every single law that's in place. You're not paying people their, their worth. But as a result, you know, out of your desperate act, you can benefit as, a, you know, in, in that process and get things made and it's now been going on so long that I think that there's a whole craft, a whole uh, level of folks through the crafts that also practice the, the old idea of I'll do one for them so I can do one for me. That I think everyone in the film business entered the film business because of the glory of the art and their dream of what it can do and they don't want to exchange their labor solely for a paycheck to further something that doesn't do that. It's a complicated process when you need to support a national infrastructure and industry where you need to make sure that your creative class as well as your technical class can sustain themselves so that they're there to compete against the, the, the tyranny uh, of well capitalized you know global uh, studios you know it's it's you know it's a sticky wicket that I'm not sure however to get to get through it but I do know that because I have no choice as a creator but to think through where my audience is you know I, I spent a great deal of time trying to think about where underserved audiences are, where aggregated audiences are, and how I can incentivize the audience. That when I started making independent film, it was really on that very simple idea that I was going to serve underserved audiences. And we went for the lowest hanging fruit, which were the, the five basic demographics of race, creed, sexual orientation, uh, class. Hmm. There was another one. Hmm. Haircuts, <laughs> yeah. but but wherever people and and gender, yeah, ba basically, that that you could look at any of those things and see communities that were already gathered that usually had their own communication system in place and that weren't being served by the corporate mass market world. It was easy, you know. So, like when you when we made a film like like Wedding Banquet. And people said, oh, this movie will never sell because it feels like a film from the 40s, except it's gay and it's Chinese. You know, <laughs> you know, 
you, you realize, yeah, that's why it's going to do really well, you know, it's because we can reach those folks. Um, and it was the right time while they were still underserved. It's no longer the case. But you certainly can now look through the internet and find far more segregated communities that equally are together and haven't been delivered their content. I have to address them if I want to create. That's my requirement because I can't ask anyone for money other than those folks who can see a, the return on doing it. Final question so. at the back. Uh, yeah, hi. My name is Andre. Uh, I'm a EC member of FERA. Um, I'm from Germany. And uh, this might be stupid, uh, but, but I have to ask it because I've, I've been to so many presentations and lectures on online distribution and all, all these kind of stuff. And everybody was saying, the, the new brave world is here and wake up people and take your chance and the opportunities are uh, just there and you can do everything, everything is possible. And uh, what I discovered during the last year was I, I was writing three novels and three, three, three screenplays at the same time. And during this period, I, I hardly could see any movie in cinema or on TV. And my fear is if, 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 I, if I do all these things, you know, uh, Facebook and, and, and Twitter, Twitter, Foxy, whatever is there, right, <laughs> to do my marketing campaign. I might end up being a perfect or, or okay-ish marketing campaigner, but I'm not a filmmaker anymore because I don't have time to shoot. So what my question would be, how can I avoid this and how can I stretch or extend my 24 hours a day doing this? <laughs> um, in much the same way that I guess I... Uh, did, did a clone of those other talks that you heard on the, the future of cinema. You just had, need to find a way to clone yourself and then you can answer you know, that, that question. But I don't think, you know, I think it's often misunderstood when someone says DIY or you, know, you have to take responsibility of your work through all the steps of the process. That really what you're trying to do is find your collaborators just like you would find the DP your designer, your casting director, you know, and that side of the industry, which once was fully corporatized, is becoming much more individualized. That you can find collaborators and other folks that will have done the work of audience building in like-minded ways that you can collaborate with. And you have to invest some of the time to, to you know, in your work to do that. It's not saying that you know, you, you will not be able to be a filmmaker, but what I'm saying is the definition of cinema has been actually been, been very short-sighted. We think of it only often as like development, production, post-production, distribution and marketing. And all those other aspects of it, like discovery, engagement, collaboration, you know, uh, how you shift an audience from one, one entity to another, all of that is the dialogue that happens in the screen and with the audience. And because it's no longer relegated only to a darkened room in a uh, specific location, it's a much different medium and a much different process than it has been before. But you're still trying to apply the same techniques and the same tools to your creative practice and your business practice when the world has changed. So they're right, those people that spoke before me at all your other panels, wake up and change what you're doing, you know? <laughs> Thank you to Ted.